Hey yo everybody, Zach Cords here with RevZilla and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider where we learn about motorcycles as we ride. The guest today, Suzuki's GSXS 1000 GT Plus. That is a new for 2022 sport touring bike offered for just north of $13,000. At its core, the engine of the mighty 2005 GSXR 1000, <laughs> which I know might sound a little weird to use a 17 year old engine in a brand new bike, but laugh at the K5 Gixxer at your peril as we learned in our CTXP episode. Wrapped around that retuned engine, you've got a sporty chassis, touring features, and color matched saddlebags that add $650 to the price and a plus to the name. So is this yet another iteration of the K5 Gixxer engine, or is it yet another iteration of the K5 Gixxer engine? We don't know yet, but as always, the ride will tell. Okie dokie, everybody. Before we dive into this highly anticipated sport touring model ride and review, uh, a friendly reminder that this episode of Daily Rider is brought to you by Quadlock. Quadlock makes a variety of mobile device chargers, cases, and mounts for all the vehicles we cover here on Daily Rider and many more. Most importantly, they support Daily Rider, which means for every Quadlock product you buy at RevZilla.com, Daily Rider gets a little slice of that. So thanks to Quadlock uh, for keeping gas in our tanks over here at Daily Rider. To check out Quadlock products and to support Daily Rider, click on the tag or in the link in the description of this video. Okie dokie. Now, the GSXS 1000 GT Plus. We'll start with the engine, as we often do. 999cc engine from, like I said, almost 20 years ago. Uh, we'll learn more about how that works later on in the program. Some of the good stuff, I would say Brembo calipers, adjustable suspension, and kind of a nice touch, this uh, nice trellis subframe, which is removable, I don't know, in case it, uh, in case it gets damaged, or uh, it's just nice looking also, I think. <laughs> Some of the not as good stuff, this uh, underbelly muffler system means that there's no center stand uh, and no center stand option, as far as I understand it. Uh, of course, that leads to a stubby pipe, which means that the right saddlebag is not affected in capacity by the exhaust. So that is sort of a, you know, it's a bad thing and a good thing, I suppose, the underbelly exhaust there. Um, what else we got that I was going to point out? Oh, yeah. Uh, no uh, remote preload adjustment for the shock, um, which, you know, lots of bikes have uh, and I think would be a good addition to this machine, and also no adjustable windscreen. So, you know, some good stuff, some bad stuff. You know, we're, we're, already, uh, we're already making compromises here. We haven't even started the thing up yet. Um, but yeah, let's, let's uh, fire it up. Let's listen to that uh, Dave the Jixer engine. The old single touch uh, start from Suzuki, which if you care about that, it's kind of cool. And uh, yeah, sounds like a, an inline four liter bike. We'll hear plenty more of that engine in the next 20 or 25 minutos or so. I think we're ready, yeah? Very polarizing looks, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, you make your own decision there. All right, let's ride, daily riders. Am I right? All right, how about some specs on the old Gixxas 1000 GT Plus, eh? You've got uh, a five gallon fuel tank, which is good, not great, I would say, as far as a, a sport touring bike. When that five gallon tank is full, the bike weighed 502 pounds on the Daily Rider scales, uh, which is pretty good considering that, um, you know, a uh, BMW S1000XR or Kawasaki Ninja 1000SX, those bikes are in the 535 range. So yeah, not too bad. The seat height is 31.9 inches, I believe. You know, around 32 inches, pretty standard seat height for any regular size motorcycle. <laughs> And uh, horsepower claimed is 150, 150, which is a pretty big number for a $13,000 sport touring bike. <laughs> so yeah, them's your specs, kids. Hope I didn't miss anything. If I did, everything's in the description of the video as always. Riding position on the Jixxas 1000 GT 
uh, is an interesting discussion because I got a lot of comments on social media. It seems like people think that it's kind of racy um, because of the sort of low front end and the aggressive uh, fairing shape and that kind of thing. But as you can see, uh, there are no clip-ons here. It's a, it's a handlebar, flat handlebar is set up across the top. So it kind of has a, an Aprilia Tuono feel to it. Um, actually fairly upright. Thank you, everybody. Uh, surprisingly upright, I would say. Uh, the only thing that feels particularly sporty about it is the seat to peg ratios. And for taller riders, uh, you might get a little cramped over time uh, with the, the leg room. But in general, it's a very agreeable riding position. I think it's quite nice. I really like it. Alrighty. Out on to what qualifies for an open road in Los Angeles. I think I've made all the traffic jokes I can make at this point about how the freeways are often clogged up here. But uh, if you're using your Jixus 1000 GT in any manner, even close to the intended purpose, <laughs> you'll be spending some time on the highway. And uh, good news, the bike's pretty good there. The one controversial piece of the Jixus 1000 GT is um, the wind protection which for me works pretty well. It puts the turbulent air kind of at the top of my chest around my collarbones, and it makes the air around my helmet a little bit noisy, but in general, it's not too bad. I am six foot two. My good friend, Ari Henning, who is about 5'10", he rode this bike and he didn't like it. He said, oh man, it really dumps air kind of at the bottom of my helmet, it makes it loud, and it creates this blade of air that when he turned his head, he felt like the air kind of grabbed the edge of the helmet and uh, it didn't work for him. So all that is to say, same report in some ways as any other motorcycle, which is to say your height will make a big difference. But it seemed particularly polarizing with this bike for what it's worth. All right, we got like 70 miles an hour or something like that. We're cruising uh, 5,000 RPM. Oop, not for long, it seems. Um, and yeah, in general, good uh, good engine for, for slogging along. It's a nice, smooth power plant. I don't agree with the gearing. I think the gearing is, the ratios are too close in the, the gearbox for my taste. They're just fourth, fifth, and sixth are all really similar. I wish fifth and sixth, there's sort of an overdrive gears for, for cruising along because at maybe 4,000, 4,500 RPM, the engine is really just loping along smooth. It's got plenty of torque. Uh, you know, a K5 Jixer engine after all. But once you um, get the, the thing spun up and you're going 75 or 80, I keep reaching for a seventh gear because it's not like oppressively buzzy or anything. It's just, it's not great. It could be better, you know? So across the big new beautiful bridge here in Long Beach, California, this is usually where I explain to you how cruise control works, even though you don't really need that ex uh, explanation. Uh, on the Jixus 1000 GT, it's a, button on the right here to trigger it and then these toggles over here to set for example so now it's set at about 60 but I don't actually know what speed it's set at because there's no set speed uh, you can see it just says uh, I hope you can see that I'm just sort of put my face down there normally or a lot of times uh, cruise control systems will have a set speed shown so that if you add a mile an hour or two or three it will show on the screen what you've set it to 63 82 whatever you want to do this one doesn't do that so when i add mileage i just sort of have to like i've hit it three times now we're going 61 2. and i started at 60 i think but i don't know if you hold it down you can feel it add speed it's just all a little bit vague um and i i like the precision of saying you know click 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 i just added three miles an hour i can see i added three miles an hour can see the bike is telling me that I'm going 67 or whatever. Um, so uh, it's minutia. It's a nit to pick, but um, you know, uh, it bothered me a little bit. And when Ari rode the bike, he noticed it as well, which I thought was uh, indicative of, um, <laughs> I don't know, either our similar opinion or, or it actually being something that might bug you. So there you have it. All right, team, we got a red light, which means hopefully we can experiment with these 150 ponies, which you really can't do very often with a 150 horsepower bike. This is a nice big three lane road. We'll just give it the pills in first gear for a second here. And you can see what it does. <laughs> it's 
there you go. 70 miles an hour and not very long. And uh, the trash control kind of caught the wheelie there, despite being in level one. Uh, it is a, it's a fast bike. That's how I would describe it, <laughs> put simply. And it's exciting. Um, certainly hits a lot harder uh, at the top of the revs than something like the Kawasaki Ninja 1000 SX, which is a very obvious comparison to this bike because they're similarly styled and priced and so on and so forth. All right, to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way, our fuel mileage figures for the Gixxas 1000 GT have been low 40s, basically. The low figure I got was about 40. Uh, high figure was 43 or something, maybe. So it's all been pretty consistent, which is not awesome if we're honest, but you know, 150 horsepower. So I don't know, 40, 40 miles to the gallon. You can't really complain too much about that, I don't think. I do think, again, if you just had some overdrive gears there, um, yeah, it'd be, be a lot more comfortable at this kind of speed on the highway, or a little more comfortable anyway, and you'd get a little bit better mileage. But um, I don't know, maybe the 2024 Gixxas 1000 GT Plus will have that feature. <laughs> well, last but not least in this section here, mirrors which are pretty good. I actually think I might have made the same comment about that uh, Cowie Ninja 1000 SX. I'm not certain, but uh, I might have said that the mirrors are really far away. And that is something that is true with this one as well. So if I'm sitting here, I can't even touch them. They're six or eight inches from the end of my hand. And that means the size of the glass gets practically smaller as it's smaller from, or it's farther from your eyeball. <laughs> Um, so they're pretty good. They just seem a little limited because they're um, so far away from the rider's face. I kind of wish they were back here. But aside from that, pretty good, pretty smooth. Not too much to complain about there. All right, off we go into the neighborhood for the old round town manners test and the stop sign challenge, of course. And like I said, uh, for the category, for the class anyway, um, just north of 500 pounds is not too bad for a bike like this. Um, it does, ooh, that was a good one. That was a good one. I'll say this about the uh, Gixxas GT here. It, I wouldn't have guessed that it was that much lighter oops, son of a, than the Ninja 1000 SX, for example. It doesn't feel particularly light coming off the kickstand. It doesn't, you know, it. <laughs> it's not, uh, really noticeably lighter, even though on the spec sheet it's significant. A few things I especially like, I'm not really not doing so hot with the uh, stop signs here though. One thing I especially like is the throttle response. I think Suzuki did a really good job with the throttle response. Uh, and I like to call this out because so many brands struggle with the, the on-off throttle response and I often complain about it and it's just sort of the way of the world now, but this engine picks up from off throttle really gently and smoothly. And I think Suzuki deserves a lot of credit because as we know, this is not uh, not a brand new engine or anything. <laughs> uh, Suzuki's team just did what they could and they did a darn good job with it. So uh, many props to the engineers at Suzuki who were in charge of the fueling. It's really, uh, it's, a, it's a cut above what most bikes offer these days. Ooh. Yeah, all right, all right. Three for five, I think. Another compliment I need to pay the bike is the quick shifter, which I find quite good, especially around town, which is why I'm bringing it up now. It sort of works as a quick shifter does uh, when you ride it on twisty roads or that kind of thing. Um, but especially, yeah, around town at low speeds and low RPMs, <laughs> the shifts are really smooth. Might be a little too soon technically to talk about brakes, but I did want to say that I, uh, they're not sharp. The, there's plenty of power when you when you pull on the lever, you know, with purpose. The bike stops just fine. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't say the brakes are bad. What I'm surprised by is it must be the compound of the pads. That was that was um, Aerie's suggestion as well. Uh, just the the initial grab of the of the brake is very soft in a way that really caught me out when I first started riding the bike. It's something I adapted to and it's not that big a deal, but uh, yeah, worth calling out and, and a little surprising, I think, 
considering Suzuki's kind of pedigree and the, the type of customer that would buy this bike. Ah! Failure. Failure on the final stop sign. Son of a toot. As for the passenger report in general, the seat is a little narrow, according to my passenger, but pretty comfortable. Decent leg room, uh, decent foot room with the saddlebags. Uh, the big sort of complaint or note that she wished to pass along to you all is that the perch is pretty high uh, above the, the rider seat. So around town and at low speeds, she was fine with it. She felt like she liked the, the grab rails and everything worked fine. But on the highway, the wind blast was significant and she felt like she either had to lean forward or not feel as um, kind of secure back there. So something to keep in mind if that pertains to you. <laughs> oh boy. All right, into the twisty road section of the Daily Rider route and cruise control is still on. I'm gonna shut that off. We don't need it. I, to put it uh, quickly, really like this bike on a twisty road. I think it works quite nicely. And to put it a little bit longer, the suspension feels a little, not harsh, it's compliant enough, but it feels almost like there's just not a lot of travel. It's just sort of, it feels a little stiff, a little rigid, a little bit, a little too sporty in my mind for, for what the bike is. Not wildly out of calibration or anything, just a little bit. But on a twisty road, I found it to work quite well. On sort of long sweeping corners, you do have to give the bike a little bit of body English to hold it in the corner in a sort of a sport bike kind of way. It's not quite as neutral as um, some other sport touring bikes. But in general, I had a blast on Twisty Roads on this bike. It really kind of encourages you to ride quickly and, uh, and it's confidence inspiring in general. So much so actually that if someone said they were gonna go to a track day with their sport touring bike and which one should they get, I've often gone back to the BMW S1000XR because I just think that bike is so capable and so potent. But if you want to spend quite a bit less, this is not a bad option. I would experiment with some different um, brake pad <laughs> compound, different brake pads, but uh, but in general, it's just a lot of fun. There's a lot of zip, a lot of power on tap, and uh, and yeah, it feels nice and planted when you sling it down instead of twisty curves, which I like. One other thing I do want to mention in this particular environment is the. Uh, ride modes, which I said that I like the throttle response and one of the reasons I like the throttle response so much is that if you put it in a mode which is more aggressive and now it just feels like it hits really hard and it's too abrupt or not abrupt it's too aggressive for my taste I don't really want that kind of feel from the engine but I still think that on off pickup is really gentle and smooth which is so rare it's almost almost 100% consistent that bikes in the sort of aggressive mode, whether it's A or mode one or whatever it is, they're just snatchy and difficult. And this bike's not snatchy and difficult. It's just aggressive, which I totally appreciate. And then you can go down to C mode, which is extra gentle. I found the uh, the medium sort of B mode to be the one that I like the best. And I think our uh, esteemed colleague, Lance Oliver, who wrote the first ride article on common tread for this bike, which you can find in the link in the description of this video, also said the same thing. He preferred the old B mode. So, you know, maybe you're an A motor, maybe you're a C motor, whatever. We're all, we're all one people, you know? <laughs> I'm actually going to turn off traction control on the fly, I might add, which is pretty cool. Not a lot of bikes let you do that. I think BMW is one of the only ones I can think of. I'm sure there are others, but, um, but I do like the being able to shut off TC on the fly. So next time we do a little acceleration punch, maybe we, get, we won't get the TC knocking back our little power wheelie. But I do want to point out the TC shut off on the fly also. I think that's a, kind of a nice feature. However, while I'm on the topic, I just remembered something. So this keypad over here is where you toggle all that information. And if I want to turn TC on, I press down for one. And if I want to turn it up a level, I go down for two, down for three, up for two, up for one up for off. Why Why is it that you'd hit the down button to make the number larger? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Alrighty. This red light is often a doozy. 
So perhaps we can talk about the dash now? Perhaps? Hopefully? I'm gonna jump into it. I like it. As I said, nice and clean. Big analog, uh, or sorry, yeah, faux analog uh, tack off to the left side of the dash there, and everything else is just pretty bold and understandable. It is 1020 AM. Is it 1020? Goodness, it is. Oh man, we got a green light. All right, well, I'm late for work, but um, the point is, <laughs> we'll do a close up a little, little bit later again. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a nice clean setup. Uh, some some of the other bikes I've reviewed lately and complained about the dash, like the Harley Pan America, it just feels kind of like muddled and there's a lot of like graphics and stuff to kind of contend with. And and this is simple, and I like it. All right, I got another red light. We'll give it another try. Um, with these OK and back buttons here, um, you can cycle through um, the uh, TC toggle, ride mode toggle, uh, and you can change the quick shifter from on to off if you want to. Though I don't know why you do that necessarily. And then at the bottom here, when you're when you're down there, you can use this keypad to get through, uh, see your range, your trips, fuel mileage, uh, odometer, battery voltage, all that kind of mumbo jumbo. And then uh, the you know, coolant temp and air temps right there. I don't know. I, the fuel gauge is a little weird because the E is always red. So every, when it's full, you sort of think like, oh no, it's empty. And then it's not. And then you realize it when it starts going down. That's a little funny. But other than that, these are really small things to worry about. <laughs> and I'm sure as I'm saying it, some of you are thinking, what are you complaining about, man? It's a fuel gauge. It's fine. It's a, it's a, you know, so you can't see what what your set speed is in the cruise control. Take it easy. It's got cruise control. And yeah, those people are right. Um, but you know, it's my job to crit critique bikes here, so I'm just uh, doing my best. You know, just doing my best here, everybody. The thing about the Jixus 1000, in all its iterations, really going back as far as I can remember, I think it's to the beginning of the line, really, um, is that when you do punch it away from a stoplight traction control on or off whatever I meant to mention this before it's not kind of the type of power or the type of chassis that really encourages you to do wheelies if that makes sense it's not really um, a sort of flirty kind of fun <laughs> the Yamata, Yamaha MT series is kind of famous for this I think you know they just do wheelies all the time MT-07 MT-09 MT-10 they're that they're not really performance oriented bikes in that way. They they almost want to do wheelies. The Jixus 1000 wants to accelerate. And it eventually does a power wheelie, which is fun and awesome. And it's it feels fast, kind of because it is fast. And I remember doing this research years ago with the Jixus 1000 from maybe 2017 or something and the Yamaha MT-10. And um, my colleague Spencer and I realized at some point that the wheelbase on the Jixus 1000 was something like three inches longer than the MT-10. And that's uh, indicative of a company that built a bike to accelerate, not to wheelie. And I don't know how I feel about that. I appreciate the performance aspect of it, but I also don't hate that the MT-10 just sort of like does big dopey wheelies all the time and it maybe doesn't accelerate as, as quickly. But what am I, trying to win a World Superbike Championship? Not really, I just wanna have fun. So, I don't know. Some musings for you on horsepower and wheelbase and wheelies. Off we go. We can punch it again a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's fast. It's fast. All right, as we head for a little shortcut here, I would like to circle back to the question that I asked at the beginning. Is this an exciting new iteration of the, the, the K5 Jixer engine? Or is it yet another tired attempt for Suzuki to recycle this thing? I don't have a really solid answer because in some ways I find the engine nothing more than fine. It's just, it works, but there really isn't anything special or new about it. And I find myself a little bit uninspired by that. However, I will say I'm impressed with the adaptation to, to the world of motorcycling in 2022. The fueling is quite good. The power is quite good. It just, it works so much better than I thought it would, really. <laughs> and again, it's that uh, K5 engine, you know, just keeps coming back. You can't kill it. Not even 
with a dirt road shortcut, presumably. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, we got the sport touring bike. We got a dirt road. We got traction control off. Let's try traction control. Oop, nope. TC. Level one. Let's see how. Uh... Ooh, that's, that's actually pretty lenient. Look at that. <laughs> Not that lenient, I suppose. All right, let's turn it off. Nope, I went, I went the wrong way. TC off. Ooh. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that, really, to anyone aside from <laughs> Aerie or something. But, uh, you know, nice wide handlebar. Feels okay. Not too bad. How's it going to handle a jump? Well, well. Uh, 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 well, I, I don't, yeah. Wouldn't recommend that either. But it didn't bottom out. Like I said, pretty compliant suspension at the end of the day. That's not, not, not too bad, actually. I don't have a lot of room to do a wheelie here, kids. Oh, and this person's turning left. And we're gonna have to delay the wheelie just a little bit. We got a construction zone and semis and a free couch. All right, we got kind of an open stretch here. Let's give it a go, shall we? Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can see it's a little a little herky-jerky and that's uh, mostly chassis dynamics though Just like I said, it doesn't want to just like go up on the back wheel and sit there It either wants to go forward or there's too much power and it wheelies a little bit. It's not really like a uh, Like I said, it doesn't really want to flirt like that. It just wants to get down to business which fair enough But if you want to do wheelie, oh yeah You can do it. You want to back it in? Not so much, really, no. EBS is not switchable, I don't believe. One more back in attempt, perhaps. Ooh, no, no, not really, not really. Again, wants to get down to business. And uh, I hope I didn't forget to talk about anything. I feel like we had a pretty good run here today. Hey-o, a white versus 650 in the back of a Tacoma. That's got to be Ari Henning. It's got to be. We've only got two spaces to work with, and I don't think it's gonna be enough for the Jixus GT. We'll get very close to this van here without touching it, and then we'll go full lock to the left. Uh, I screwed up. Right, seriously, this time, full lock to the left, feet up, and, 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 no, not, not so much. We're looking at two and a half, two and three quarter parking spaces. So it's no Aprilia Touareg 660, let's just say that. But uh, practically, as I often offer to you, um, I never found it to be a, a big problem, this steering sweep. I think it's, uh, it's decent. Sporty, but not um, inhibitive, let's say. Whew! Oh, key, do, key. Let's take a listen to this engine, shall we? Nice light flywheel. Reminds me, you know, that's a, maybe that's a, an artifact of the uh, of the K5 uh, era or engine or something like that. But uh, I just like that. I like that about my KTM from 2006. It's got like a little bap, bap, bap. Nice light flywheel. I like that. All right, Instagram questions. Let's dive in, shall we, kiddos? First one is from Tete Bay, who asks, Suzuki hasn't done anything really spectacular in the last decade. Is this its attempt to try to stay relevant since the ADV slash sport touring market is booming? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> you know, one way, it's a cynical way to look at it to say that it's just a stab at, you know, oh, I gotta stay relevant. Every company's gotta stay relevant. Every company's gotta release stuff that people are interested in. And I think Suzuki read its customer base a little bit and it knows the stuff that people have liked in the past and it went ahead and built a bike that they thought people would like and I think they did a bang up job. So does it have a whiff of desperation about it because it's Suzuki? Yes, a little bit. Um, but I think it was the right play and I think it's a good bike so I can't really fault Suzuki for that. But good question, Tay Tay Bay, I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully that uh, my take helps you there. Next question is from NYCR9T who says, Lance Oliver just wrote on Revzilla's common tread that quote the US is just not important to Suzuki. So the question is it worth being a Suzuki owner these days? This is a good call out. Lance did write a lovely article over on common tread um, titled Suzuki is not a motorcycle company and other facts or something like that. Uh, and he makes some really good points about how many cars Suzuki sells in India's uh, in India, how many uh, outboard boat engines 
it sells in the United States and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's good food for thought if you want to read. I appreciate uh, NYC R9T calling that out. As far as is it worth being a Suzuki owner these days? I think so. I want it to be. I do wish, to Tete Bay's point, that Suzuki would buckle down a little bit and just give us some jazz hands sometime soon. I don't know. Maybe quitting MotoGP will right the ship. We'll see. Next question is from Kirsian. Kirsian? Yeah. The obvious question is, how does it compare to a Ninja 1000? We talked about that a little bit, right? This engine is uh, more potent up top, arguably feels a little bit less potent down low, similar ergos, but how does it compare? Very directly, basically. <laughs> and I don't, I, if someone said they got this instead of a Ninja 1000, I wouldn't say, oh man, you made a mistake. I would say, okay, cool. Kirsian also says a less obvious question, is would it be a sensible and more practical alternative to a super naked? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you're looking at the spec sheet, you may be thinking 150 horsepower, but it has saddlebags and whatever. Someone should make a CTXP episode about this. Well, I mean, we didn't do it on super nakeds to be fair, but the point is modern sport touring bikes that are performance oriented have a lot of performance. And if you got this, I said that the riding position kind of reminded me of a Tuono and yeah, that's, it's kind of, it is a valid alternative to that. If you want something slightly more practical, uh, but you like all the horsepower and that kind of thing? Absolutely. Next question is from JJ Warstler, who asks, is it more for Jack Quartz or Barry Henning? Another CTXP reference there <laughs> um, of sport touring versus superbikes, uh, which you can please watch on the Revzilla channel if you like. I would say this is, this is Jack Quartz through and through, right? Sure, it's a K5 Jixer, which is Barry Henning's uh, you know, pride and joy, but saddlebags and uh, better wind protection and comfort, upright riding position, stuff like that. So I think that this is sort of Jack Quartz's whole point, right? Want to be comfortable, but I like to get a little, uh, I got to like to blow my hair back a little bit, you know? Okay. Last question is from Blake Cash, uh, who asks, if this GSXS, GSX mm -hmm, were an animal, what would it be? Ah, <laughs> I like this question a lot. I got some good one. I got one about a haiku, which was fantastic, and I didn't write a haiku. I apologize if you're watching. Please ask that question again. It's brilliant. I also got one about a, a body of water, which was fantastic. Thank you. I love these questions, as you all know. If it were an animal, what would it be? I think it would be one of those, like, um, what is it, like an, uh, an ocelot? Or what are those cats? They're, like, big for house cats, but small for wild cats. And, this, and like, rich people have them as pets sometimes, and occasionally they tear someone's face off. Anyway, that's what came to mind, frankly, is this sort of like, it seems docile and, and, uh, and tame and sort of like, oh, it's a sport. Yeah, it's got, you know, color match saddlebags. And it's got this high handlebar and, you know, yeah, it says GSX on the side, but like it says GSX S, not GSX S R. So like, it's not really, you know, it's nice and tame. You can, you can go up, you can pet it. It doesn't matter. It's not that scary. And then if you open it up in second gear and you really like give it the pills, holy crap, it could tear your face off if you're not careful. Um, so that's, that's what it, you know, it reminds me of a, an exotic and slightly too large jungle cat that someone has as a pet. Seems like a good idea. It's pretty, it's striking, but be cautious around it. There's some wild animal in there. Am I right? All right. Hopefully that helps. Thank you again for the questions, everybody. Really appreciate it. Let's put this sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard so that you can get on with your day for crying out loud. Hey, everybody. All right, we're inside Revzilla West here. We got lots of stuff going on. That crate over there, you see it? Contains the Dumb and Dumber bike. It is headed to the Denver Revzilla store. So if you live in Denver, by the time this video goes live, I believe the store is open and you can go see the bike if you, <laughs> if you want to. Derry's doing something with a something adventurous, I gather, because there's an adventure bike happening and there's lights everywhere. Anyway. Where do we think it falls on the board? We've got the Aprilia Touareg 660 at the top. We've got the Harley Davidson Pan America, Triumph Tiger Sport 660, and MV Agusta Turismo Veloce. And then just down here, BMW S1000 RR. MV Agusta Triumph Tiger Sport, the Jixus is better. Harley Pan America, whew, that's a tough one. I actually put this question to Ari, uh, and, and he also agreed. I don't know if he actually answered me in the end. Um, cause it's a tough, the Pan America is, it's, it's exciting and it's striking and it's a, it's a fast, fun, pretty good sport touring bike, realistically. And you get some off-road capability, of course. And the Jixus is like, not as exciting, but 
is much cheaper <laughs> and is probably going to be good for a long time. <sighs> I don't know. Um, I'm going to pick. I'm going to do the thing where I pick up the the magnet. That's what forces me into making the decision. It's not as good as an Aprilia Touareg. No way. I would get a Touareg before I got a Gixxus 1000 just because I like the capability, versatility, willies, you know, whatever. It's a dead heat. It's a dead heat. So it's, so it's coming down to price. I, I don't usually make a price, um, you know, proclamation here. Usually I say, it's your money. I don't know how much of it you have. I'm going to tell you to get the better bike. But I can't say that the Pan America is better. I can't really say the Gixxus 1000 is better either. <laughs> but good bike. Good bike, good bike, good bike. So where does it land over here? Just to look, Tracer 9 GT. Gixxus would be below that, I think. But above an NC. Ah! These are all good bikes. It'd be right in this neighborhood here. I think just below the Tracer 9 from Yamaha. That's my, that's my thinking anyway. The fueling being so good and the dash being so clean and well set up. Uh, adjust TC on the fly, that kind of thing. I really liked it. Sure, it's got some problems. It's not perfect. It's also 13 grand, which is not a ton of money for a capable sport touring bike with 150 horsepower. So there you go. There it is. It's on the board. Uh, coming down the pipe, we got more bikes. So you stay tuned <laughs> to Daily Rider. Uh, thank you for watching, hanging out. Hope you learned something. Hope you had fun and very much hope to see you next time on Daily Rider. See everybody. The screen changing every time you go under a bridge is like, <laughs> makes you think of a stand-up bit. I don't, remember, I don't remember who it was, it was Mitch Hedberg or something like that. Did a bit about uh, automatic doors and when you walk by an automatic door and it opens and and you're like, oh no, sorry man, I was just walking by. I didn't, I'm not going through. I don't, and I feel bad about the little robot in there that decides when to darken the screen when you go under a bridge. And I always think like, thank you for your help, but I didn't need, to, actually, it's just a bridge and it'll be, it's fine. You can just leave it white. It's no big deal. But again, thank you. <laughs>